I want to discuss two people. One of them is certainly one of the more major figures in the 19th century, and that's Rudolf Virchow. And the other is Robert Womack, who carried out some of the most essential research and really didn't get full credit for it for quite a while. And in fact, maybe has never gotten appropriate credit. It certainly had some real problems with his life. So we're going to cover both of them because as you can tell, both of these people ended up working with Miller at various times. And it looks like they were part of what you might have ended up calling a kind of a Berlin mafia of researchers. We went through a little bit of it last time. And we talked about how Schwann was a major figure in there and Schleiden had been part of the group. But there are others as well. We're not going to cover each one of them because I guess in my sense, what I want to do is, is to a certain extent emphasize their microscopy. Although you'll see it's, it becomes very hard to do that. And I'll say one other thing that I find kind of frustrating in kind of in putting this thing together. There are references throughout the literature to these various people using one or another type of microscope. And the classic one is a microscope designed by a man named Fraunhofer. You may have heard the name of Fraunhofer in physics because Fraunhofer not only designed optical lenses, but he also designed a spectroscope. And he was the one that identified the lines in the spectrum from the sun, the uh, Fraunhofer lines. But on the side, he also made these microscopes, some of which were considered really exceptional. So I've looked around to see what I could find because I thought it would be nice to illustrate what these microscopes were like. And when you do, and you, there are a couple of places where you can look up the museums of microscopes and see what they look like. They all look like microscopes of, of sort of 19th century microscopes. That is certainly the beginning of the, of the century. They're all tubes mounted on a wooden base there are maybe little subtleties in the way they focus, but basically they all look the same. What's different about them is the lenses within them. And I haven't been able to find any examples except for the very early stuff we discussed, Brian Ford doing these interesting experiments with von Leeuwenhoek microscopes. I haven't been able to find somebody that has done a sort of a comparative study of what a standard sample looks like through several of these different kinds of microscopes. As we get later in the, in the 19th century, we start moving into the Zeiss and the, the more elaborate microscopes, then we may begin to see some data like that. But for people to go to a museum now and collect images through different microscopes, something that just I haven't been able to find yet. So we'll just sort of put that on the side, remembering that what was happening was that by and large microscopes at this time, starting around 1820, 1830, were starting to show up with achromatic and aspheric lenses so that the information that one could see through them was getting better and better. At the same time, the transmission of light, the condenser systems were improving, but still they all had, you know, a, a curved mirror at the base. Not remember that they didn't have a great deal of light sources available to them. At any rate, that's one of the themes that I'm hoping to develop, but it's, it's turning out to be a little tricky. The other one is the idea of how people were preparing samples. And you'll see that we're going to discuss a little bit today for the work of Robert Remack, who was one of the people who put a lot of effort into 
trying to preserve tissues in a way that he could see things properly. But again, that's material that's somewhat hard to dig out of the papers. And I'm working on it, but I don't have all of it yet. You may remember there were some comments early on, for instance, from Schleiden, that the nucleus stained with iodine. And this is a hint to the idea that people were starting to think about staining techniques and preserving techniques for tissues. Even Hook talked a bit about using alcohol to preserve tissues, although in his case, the tissue got up and walked away. Can't win them all. So let's get back then to look for a short while at Robert Rimac. Robert Rimac is one of those people who started out working with Miller. And then as it turns out, had a great deal of trouble in his life in finding a good position. And the reason was that he was an Orthodox Jew. Now in Germany at the time, it was okay to be Jewish. That is, it, you weren't formally discriminated against. Jews could be taught, Jews could go to school, but there was a kind of an informal barrier to giving them university positions. And he was one of those victims of that. Many of the Jews in Germany at that time allowed themselves to be baptized. And when that happened, they become sort of Christians slash Jews. And then they were able to get positions. But apparently Ramak felt so strongly, he was an Orthodox Jew, he was unwilling to make that kind of sacrifice. And so he uh, did suffer through, as a result of that. Nevertheless, he made extraordinary observations that are still recognized, certainly in neuroscience, because a great deal of what he contributed had to do with seeing what was going on in the nervous system, what the nerve fibers consisted of. He demonstrated that ganglia were the source of nerve fibers, the cells within the ganglia gave rise to the nerve fibers that came out. He identified within certain neurons what was inside them. That is in, in the sense that we, you may remember, I showed you this wonderful image of Schwann's, right? Where Schwann showed something like this, for a hollow nerve with a cell in it, right? What Rimach showed was that if you kind of squeeze this thing and look at it very carefully, it's not filled with liquid, but it's filled with some sort of fibrous material. And that was part of what he came up with, the idea that nerves weren't just hollow tubes, but that they were in fact organized structures within them. Now we know that those things are microtubules and complicated structures of various sorts. But he was the first to identify that. I think he called it a primitive band, something of that sort, okay? But the other thing that he was clearly interested in, he became fascinated by embryology, by the development of the chick. And let me see if I can show you a couple of images. So he put together eventually a book. It was published in sort of 1855 or so. And it was called, this is the German title, The Development of Vertebrates. Wirbeltiere is vertebrate animals. And uh, he dedicated it to Alexander von Humboldt. Humboldt was a leading scientist of the 19th century, famous more for his work on electrical con conductivity and electrical behavior of biological material, as well as I think some theoretical electrical concepts. So these are some pictures just to give a sense of the kind of detail that he went through in looking at embryological structures. So you can start with something like this that has only, well, these are already going through some sort of tissue rearrangements. 
Okay, but eventually you get to this structure where you find the mural tube and the notochord within it. You get this sort of structure here. And then eventually it grows into more of an embryo like this. So he was involved very much in looking at this. He spent a lot of time looking at chick embryos. And one of the things he got involved with was asking about how these cells develop and where do they come from. And I'll just show you a couple of quick pictures on this. This is the, uh, the standard picture now, although it's from his paper, his book. This is a picture of what you see in the chick egg, on the very surface of the chick egg, if you catch it right after fertilization and you start to get the development of the embryo. And what you have here is a structure that's sort of strange given uh, his terminology later on, but we generally call that thing a primitive streak. And that's the unit that eventually folds in to form the spinal cord, okay? So if I go back into this picture here, you see this kind of structure, except instead of being in a something like a frog embryo, which this might be, it's sitting on the surface of the yolk, which is something of a surprise. And it took quite a while for people to realize this was going on. Well, at the same time he was interested in this, he started asking where the blood cells come from. This particular picture is again, a, a frog's egg splitting in which he finally can demonstrate that there's a division that occurs between the nuclei. First to give from one, to give you a second, and then the two of these then divide themselves. And so he ended up with diagrams such as the one over here, in which you say you take a single cell, it has within it a nucleolus. His vision then is that the nucleolus itself splits first. So you now end up with two nucleoli within the nucleus. Then the nuclei themselves divide like this. And then eventually you get the formation of two cells that are distinct. Part of what he did in order to see this was to be able to identify what we would now think of as the cell surface and various bits of literature talk about this thing as the the membrane, the cell membrane, which is not exactly an accurate term for this thing. But what he found is that if you had a mixture of copper sulfate, vinegar, and alcohol, you could actually create something that stiffened and supported the structure of this cell membrane. And so as a result of that, he was able to propose that, that all the cells in the body, remember going back to Schwann and Schleiden, that the body was full of cells, that the way you got new cells was through division of the existing cells. This is very different from what Schleiden and Schwann had to say. Remember, Schleiden sort of finessed this by talking about crystallization of cells. And I really have had some trouble trying to define exactly what he means by it. But I think his argument was something like this. If you have crystals, so here's a crystal, and you place it in a solution of high concentrations of salt, each crystal can catalyze in some way, can guide the formation of adjacent crystals of a similar sort. And Schwann liked this idea to apply to cells with the idea that, okay, if you have a cell, 
We know it has a nucleus. And there's material along the side of the cell somehow that catalyzes a change in the connection between these cells so that you end up with another one. As I say, that seems to me now that this is a very vague system, very poorly defined. But what he had in mind was the analogy to crystals. And clearly it's incorrect. So what Remak was able to do was to say, hey, look, if we really look at it carefully, every cell gives rise to another cell by a division process. All cells give rise to other cells. And he produced this result. He published it early on in that major book on development of, of uh, chicks, on the development of vertebrates. But it actually didn't get a great deal of, of acceptance for whatever reasons. It took another 10 years before Rudolf Virchow reviewed the same material. He published it in this book. And I've got two versions of this thing up just to show you. Originally in 1858, Virchow gave a series of lectures. I'll come back a little bit to its history. But he gave a series of lectures, 20 lectures, on what he called cellular pathology. And the lectures, the notes for the lectures were taken down by students who then put them together into a book for him to eventually publish. So this book came out for what it's worth, it has 157, these are woodcuts of illustrations that are in there. This is a translation into English that was done a few years later. Should have the date on here, but I don't see it. There it is. No, that's of his lectures in 1858. So this would have been 10 years later. The book was in fact, an essential Bible for understanding this field of cellular pathology. And in it, Virchow made a couple of very important statements. First of all, he showed lots and lots of images of various kinds of cells. And these are just accumulations of different types of cells that he saw throughout the body. Not that different from the sort of stuff you saw from Schwann. Okay. But I couldn't resist. Here's the German above it, and here's a translation. This translation is done by Google Translate. So here's basically what it says. I'm not going to even try to read the German because my German pronunciation is really pretty awful. But he says, even if you get fungus or algae, we won't allow in our theory of tissue that a new cell could be built up from non-cellular material. That's his important point. Where a cell arises, it must have been preceded by a cell. And he uses this phrase, omnis, Cellula e cellula. That is, every cell comes from another cell. And he popularizes this phrase throughout the book, just as it says, an animal can only arise from the animal that gave rise to it, a plant only from the plant. In this way, although there are individual points in the body where the strict proof hasn't yet been provided, the principle is there that in the whole series, everything living, whether whole plants or whole organisms or integrating parts of them is in a process of continuous development and all coming from cells. This is very different from the overwhelming ideas still of spontaneous generation, which were that you could get cells and cellular structures to appear 
out of non-cellular material, but that you actually needed living material in order to generate it. So later on in the book, he starts to say this even in more, in a bit more elaborate way. What he says is in almost no, all cases that he's looked at. So he's looking at all sorts of cells. He says, in all cases, new formations may be sound, found by a process of ordinary cell division from previously existing cells. And then he goes on, this is a very interesting point, that in some cases, they continue to resemble the parent cells. And in other cases, they become different. And then he has some, some terminological stuff, which is perhaps less necessary, except then at the end, he says, you can get some changes here. And they become injurious, although they're not properly malignant necessarily, he says. But wherever this happens, you can get damage to the body as a result of damaged cells. And so this is the other part of his philosophy, which is, first of all, so I'll just make it truly explicit. All cells come from pre-existing cells. And then he says damaged. In other words, that disease arises from illness of the cells themselves. Actually, this created a problem for him philosophically because it made him deny the idea that you could have external things that cause disease. In other words, he, he, his feeling was so strong about this that the idea that you would become infected with some other organism, and that would be the cause of the disease, turned out to be a very hard thing for him to absorb. Although you'll see as we talk a little bit more about what he did, this turns out to be uh, almost an internal paradox for him. Let me go back then and take a quick look with you at some of the other aspects of his life. So, you can tell that he was a devoted microscopist. He was a student of Miller's, which meant that he had been trained in a very good formal way of science. And then it turns out he's a, a really very strong figure in a lot of ways. So he was having trouble getting some of his early work accepted. This is in 1847. He formed his own journal in which he said you would only publish things that were just scientifically proven, since obviously his work would fit into that. But it, it became a foundational journal, which is now called Virchow's Archives, and it's still being published today. He was also, and here's where it starts to get kind of interesting, he was also a revolutionary. He was quite liberal and he, there was a major revolution that took place in, in Germany in 1848. And the end result of that was uh, he joined the revolution. He contributed somewhat. He wrote a journal. He set up a new manuscript, a journal called the uh, Revolutionary Journal or something of that sort, which lasted a year or two. And then he lost his job, surprisingly enough, in the hospital in which he'd been working in Berlin. And he moved to Würzburg. And he spent about six or eight years there. 
during which time he concentrated on the kind of research that gave rise eventually to this cellular pathology book, which is really an extraordinary thing to go through. It's about 600 pages in which he goes through one cell type after another and what goes wrong with it and what is in it. And this is where his famous omnicellular cellular statement appears many times in the book as a mantra. Perhaps we'd call it a meme. The sort of sad story in this is that the work that gave rise to that idea actually came from Rimac. And actually, initially, Virchow didn't believe all that work, but eventually came around to understanding it. And he knew Rimac. They had worked together in Miller's lab, or they had crossed paths in Miller's lab for a while. They knew who they were. And if you read through the book, he refers a fair amount to Rimac's work in neuroanatomy but he never relates to this demonstration that Rimac had made that all cells give rise to other cells. And Rimac had made that. Uh, apparently it created a real problem between the two of them. And all you can read about is that from that point on, they didn't get along. The other thing that was interesting about what Virchow did was he started following up some work on cancer and what the origins of cancer were. We have to go back a little bit to things we haven't discussed, but it turns out that Miller had a theory of cancer as well. And Miller's theory of cancer had to do more with this idea of foreign material being part of being um, catalyzed, foreign meaning non-cellular material, being catalyzed to form these unusual cells, that these were a different type of cell that were generated. And what Virchow realized was that in fact, cancer cells came from tissue cells themselves, that they were related to the tissues from which they arose. And he came up with an idea, he developed an idea that there was some sort of irritation. It's a funny term to use, okay? We might today call it inflammation. And at the time that was pretty much dismissed. And I would say pretty much dismissed for quite a while, the idea that you could induce cancer with certain kinds of irritation until the modern work on cancer induction by things like tobacco smoke and asbestos and the rest of the factors that now seem to be involved in induction of cancer one way or the other. And of course, now we know it much more in terms of immunological effects, of cytokine effects, as well as DNA changes. So it's, there's an interesting sense in which he had an idea, but didn't have the data to put it together, didn't have the understanding to put it together. Just to give you an idea of the breadth of Virchow's work though, he found he was sort of in the field at the time when nothing had names. So he introduced all of these terms which we now think of as just sort of part and parcel of biology, right? Now, a lot of these terms he used in, in German versions, but the basic idea of them, the idea that there was a structure in the nucleus that you would call chromatin, that the osteoid was a structure in bone, that there was a disease you would call spina bifida. All of this stuff arose from his work at the time that he was doing it. He came up with things that needed definition and ended up coming up with those definitions. So Virchow was a major figure. He's considered to be 
the father of modern cellular pathology. But he became also a public figure in many, many ways. And this is what I want to mention for now. Let's start with the major challenge to him, in a sense, which was Darwinism for reasons that are not entirely clear. That is, it was not a religious objection, but there was something else that Virchow felt that especially for human evolution, you couldn't, he couldn't argue for the way, for the theory that Darwin had that even humans arose through an evolutionary process. And part of the argument had to do with what the Neanderthal was. They had found the Neanderthal skeletons and people by and large felt that Neanderthal was sufficiently different from human that it was another species entirely distinct. He apparently re reviewed the same fossils and said, no, this is actually just a distorted human being who had been injured or distorted. In other words, the Neanderthal was not an example of human evolution at all. It was just an old damaged human. Now, as a result of this kind of thing, Virchow, who, as you probably have figured out, is a man who sensed great authority in himself, he considered Darwin, as you see, an ignoramus. Heckel was the other one who was very supportive of, of Darwin. We won't get to talk too much about Heckel. We may bring him up a little bit later. Anyway, they got into enormous date, debates over this thing. And one of the things that came out about it was that Heckel pleaded at the German Association for Naturalists and Physicians, that evolution be included in public school curricula. And we'll come to this in a moment, the idea of Darwinism versus social Darwinism, okay? And so his idea was that you should be able to teach this material because there had been a teacher who was teaching about the inanimate origin of life from carbon, which in fact was considered a problem. And so this ended up with a big debate with Virchow. Virchow felt that Darwinism was a hypothesis and morally dangerous, which is an interesting issue. And Heckel and Virchow argued back and forth for a while and the end result of this, because of Virchow's authority, was that in 1882, the Prussian education policy excluded natural history, which meant Darwinism from schools. How extraordinary. We still have stories like that that go on these days, right? If you look back in the newspapers, the debate over whether or not to teach evolution is still considered an important one. Virchow got himself involved in other things as well. This is sort of an interesting one, in a way, given the concern with evolution and his dislike of the idea of evolution, which you would think means a dislike of a kind of a blending of character of things that emerge gradually, which is one way to think about it. Virchow was more concerned, I think, with this field that emerged of what was called social Darwinism. And social Darwinism was an adaptation of the principle of survival of the fittest to say that those people who are surviving best 
are the fittest of them. That means the people who are rich. Huh. Or the people who are running society. And those other societies which hadn't reached the level of organization of European society as it emerged, but those people really didn't belong in, in the full society because they would eventually be weeded out as unfit. And you may be aware that this gave rise eventually to the theory of uh, behavior of eugenics which haunted the early phases of the 20th century. And that eugenics suggested as a field that it should be possible then to select those that are most fit. By whatever the definition is. And I don't know the best way of saying that. So maybe I'll just say dispose of those who are. And if you read this thing at all, you may read it as an interpretation that was, that was picked up by the Nazis and led to things like this idea of an Aryan race and superiority of one type or another. So here's where the paradox is. Although Virchow didn't believe in Darwinism, in Darwin at all, he was especially upset at this idea that survival of the fittest principles could be applied to human behavior and to human society. And so he did a study first of all, on what he called craniology, and the data here aren't exactly clear, but the field was one where they measured the sizes of heads of various people. But in addition, he took it even further and analyzed hair, skin, and eye color of, as you can see, an enormous number of children, six and a half million, school children to see if he could identify the Jews separate from the Aryans. Since this was part of what was arising, arising as a form of anti-Semitism. And what he concluded was in fact, he couldn't see a difference. Okay, that there could not be a Jewish nor a German race. Once again, you can see these, these debates still going on in, in contemporary life, not necessarily for Jews versus Germans, but with other population groups. It's really quite, quite an extraordinary, pervasive set of theories. And this is an example of a situation where by using data, Virchow was able to show, in fact, there were no differences, which I think is. Another thing about Virchow, as he continued to develop, he clearly understood that there was a relationship between disease and economics. And this is why he called it, he said, medicine is a social science and politics is nothing but medicine on a large scale. In other words, if you work with the politics, if you create the appropriate social science, medicine will be rather different. You don't have to worry about certain kinds of disease issues. So he says, medicine has the obligation to point out the problems and to see what can be done about them, to raise the problems, but the politician and he says the practical anthropologist, we'll see that in a minute, okay, has to find the reasons for, for solving these things. That basically science just tells you what you have to know. But if medicine is to fulfill her task, then 
doctors have to get involved in political and social life. The physicians, I love this line, are the natural attorneys of the poor. They are the people whose commitment to curing disease also implies that they have to push for the for curing the social ills that, that are part of this. So he was quite a radical in a lot of ways. So in 1859, he in fact entered politics. He became first in the municipal council of Berlin, and then he was elected to the Prussian Diet, Diet, which is the parliament, Prussian parliament, and became the leader of the progressive groups from there. Eventually he became, when Germany got more unified, a member of the Reichstag, which was the, the final, the uh, parliamentary structure. So he worked to improve healthcare conditions, working towards modern water systems. And then on the side, <laughs> he's credited as the founder of the field of anthropology. He got very interested in digging up antique societies as well as this idea that I just discussed about social medicine. So Virchow is an example of a person who did remarkable and very effective scientific work, who then took his science and modified his behavior, if you will, to make that a more public environment, okay? To, to have a public, so there's a story. I have to leave you with this kind of amusing story. It's not clear if this is real or not, but very clearly he was an antagonist of Bismarck. Bismarck was the leader of Germany at the time. Bismarck was a militarist, had spent a lot of money on the military, built it up. So at some point, Bismarck challenged Virchow to a duel and then Depends on whose story you like. Virchow said, nah, I don't believe in dueling as a way to solve a conflict, which is a perfectly rational thing to do. But the other story, which you just have to know because sometimes someone may ask you this. It's not clear if it's true or not, but it's part of a legend. In dueling, if you are challenged, you can choose your weapons. And so Virchow said, okay, let's, let's duel with these two sausages. Now the difference between these two sausages is one has trichinella larvae. Trichinella are a parasite that live in pork and are responsible for a lot of very serious disease called trichinosis. It turns out Virchow was the one who had identified these maggots in the pork. So he said, okay, I'll give you the infected one. I'll have the safe one. You can, we'll have a duel with, with the sausages. It's not clear what the physics of this kind of sausage duel would be. But at any rate, that's the, the story. And apparently Bismarck declined. Whether this is true or not is hard to say. It says here it's documented in the contemporary scientific literature, which just means it was a good story at the time. The side part of this though, is that Virchow had defined, identified these larvae in pork and using that showed that you could use a not very sophisticated microscope to see it in pork and that it was worth setting up an inspection system throughout Germany and later on much more widely to inspect meat for trichinosis. So the sort of the, the pork story, the sausage du duel story fits in a little bit with the idea of Virchow as, as a social reformer and as a medical reformer. I mean, these are very important things to imagine coming from a man who initially 
set up himself as a scientist and the founder of a field of medicine, pathology, based on cellular material. So in a way, if I go back to my original page here, there is something so strikingly different about these two men who both started in the same, roughly the same place. That is, they were both in this Charité hospital in Berlin. They were both working with Miller. And then they took off in entirely different pathways. Some of it, obviously, constrained by, by Rimach's religion and also a certain sense of his, I think of his honesty to himself about what he wanted to do. I will say, which I didn't mention before, that he supported himself towards the end of his life as a physician, emphasizing this field of galvano galvanotherapy, which actually meant applying electrical current to the nerves or the muscles. And he, as a neuroscientist, actually used it to, to uh, try to affect nervous behavior. So very different kinds of pathways. And Virchow, on the other hand, became an extraordinarily public, public figure. And I'll leave you with this picture, which was developed for Vanity Fair magazine. And so Vanity Fair was popular magazine, still around, as you know. And they commissioned a series of pictures of men of the day, as you see, or specific well-known people. And they included, among others, there's a set of the Curies, of course, as well. But there is this picture of Virchow in which he looks sort of remarkably benign at this point. This was in 1893, about 10 years before he died. But I thought that was a kind of a neat way to imagine a man going from these very basic types of research in cellular structure to a major, a major public presence. So I think I can stop here.